Hi everybody, my name's Mark and I'm really glad to be with you today to talk about RAP. RAP has made a big difference in my life and I hope it'll make a big difference in yours too. I um, want to start out by telling you a little bit of, of my story and how I got involved with RAP. Um, I grew up in a home, oldest of five children, uh, where there was active addiction and unexamined uh, mental illness. Uh, with my mother. And uh, growing up in that environment, uh, there was a lot of chaos and uh, just, a, yeah, just a lot of chaos. And so um, as I got older, um, you know, which is what happens a lot of times with families that grow up in dysfunctional environments like this, is uh, I started doing things to self-medicate. I started using drugs and alcohol, uh, practicing uh, risky behavior, and things like that. And that actually worked for me for a while until it didn't work anymore. Um, when I got into my early 20s, I started experiencing some pretty significant anxiety and depression. Uh, got on medication, uh, name an antidepressant or mood stabilizer, and I've probably tried it. And uh, those worked for a while until they didn't work anymore because, uh, because I wasn't really examining uh, what was going on and where some of these feelings were coming from and so forth. Um, I did get into a 12-step program for people that are family members or of people with addiction. And that's been a big part of my, my recovery journey because uh, these are meetings where you can share opus, openly and honestly with other people without being judged, um, which that's actually been my experience of rap as well, so I see some similarities there. Um, <clears throat> I started as the director of San Antonio Clubhouse 18 years ago, which is a nonprofit that works with adults that are experiencing mental health challenges, and so the clubhouse has actually been a big part of my recovery too, because I'm inspired every day by the people that come to the clubhouse. Uh, a few months ago, I, I had known sort of uh, peripherally a little bit about rap, but, but not a whole lot. And a few months ago, uh, I, I got to get involved with it uh, by going through a rap class uh, with our local uh, San Antonio State Hospital. Our organization has a partnership with the San Antonio State Hospital. Um, and as I went through that level one class, um, there were some really eye-opening things that happened with me. You know, as, as I said earlier, there was a lot of things in my own life with my own mental health challenges that I was not examining and was not taking the time to, to look at. It's almost like when I was not in a good place uh, mentally, I was in crisis mode. I wasn't stopping to think about what sort of things I need to address that might help me with those symptoms. It was more like, what do I need to do to get immediate le relief right now? And that's where the drugs and alcohol and all that other stuff kind of started happening. Well, RAP gave me the opportunity I think the beautiful thing about RAP is that, first of all, it happened in a classroom with other people that have something in common with me. So uh, within a short time, I felt, I felt safe with the group. I felt like I could be open and honest. I think other people felt the same thing as well. And then as we got into the curriculum of RAP, uh, it just, everything began to make sense to me. I realized that there, there were little elements of RAP that that I was doing to manage my own mental health recovery that perhaps I didn't even know, uh, how can I say it, I didn't, I was doing these things not knowing it was something organized. I mean, just a, a, a simple example I'll give is uh, animal videos, okay? When I'm feeling bad, one of the things that helps me is to just stop what I'm doing, and I'm, you know, this is gonna sound wild, but you know, this is what works for me is to stop what I'm doing and uh, start watching animal videos. Uh, watching especially uh, an animal species interacting with other species, because I, I find it very, um, I don't know, I just enjoy it a lot. So that was really a, a wellness tool that I had and didn't even realize it. So I also had the opportunity to go through the, the level one class as an apprentice a couple of times um, and then I went in, uh, to the level two uh, RAP uh, in Maryland, and so was able to come back and help facilitate. And I co-facilitated with a colleague of mine here at the clubhouse, but both of us were also mentored by two people that have been um, instrumental in the, in the RAP com community for a while, and uh, were very strong uh, mentors for me and my colleague as we learned about 
about how to facilitate a RAP class, so, um, or a RAP curriculum. So what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about what RAP is, just to prepare you all for what you're going to experience in the class. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use these as, as sort of a prop. Um, the uh, RAP talks about the, the four parts to the study of mental health recovery, and the first one is the five key, key concept of mental health recovery, which are hope, personal responsibility, education, self-advocacy, and support. And again, for me in the class, this was a real aha moment for me because I realized that this is a really good outline for um, just kind of either sometimes coping and sometimes just really managing well. You know, the idea of hope. When I get in that really bad place, there's always that one part of me knows that, that knows that this too shall pass. No matter how dark things might get, it always passes. And yes, it comes again, but just to know that there's an endpoint, um, that there is hope, um, has been very help helpful for me. Um, the other is personal responsibility. As I said, I, I grew up with um, unexamined mental illness in the home, and the person that was experiencing that unexamined uh, mental illness, uh, and this is not to blame that person, it was just how she sort of handled it, um, was to blame everyone else for her problems. And you know, I've been guilty of that too. And, and the problem is, when I'm spending all my time blaming other people, I can't stop and look at what's going on inside me and take personal re responsibility for it. Because ultimately, no matter what our family of origin is, no matter what kind of background we've had, ultimately we have to take responsibility for where we are for our own mental health. Uh, so that's a really important concept for me. Um, the other is education. Um, I, do, I do a lot of reading. I do um, a lot of spiritual reading, um, which helps me. Um, some self-help books. I've got a pretty large uh, self-help library at home. And reading really helps me internalize ideas that help me in managing my mental health. Um, Self-advocacy. Really, um, you know, I see that as just having the willingness and the courage to, uh, to ask for what I need, to speak up for myself. Instead of suffering in silence, speaking to people, loved ones, employers, whoever, letting folks know what I need um, instead of suffering in silence. Um, and the other is support. Uh, I mentioned my 12-step program. My 12-step group is my home group is a very important support to me. Uh, these are folks that help keep me accountable. My sponsor helps keep me accountable. Um, I need that support system because, well, really because um, you know, we're, we're human beings, we're social beings, so we're, we're, we are designed to be in relationship with other people. We can't live in isolation. And I think, speaking from personal experience, as someone with lived experience, especially when, uh, when I'm dealing with those mental health challenges, that's the time I should not be isolating, even though that's, that's what my brain tells me to do. So I need to be able to reach out to that support system. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the wellness toolbox. Um, it says a list of skills and strategies that you have used or want to use to keep yourself well and to help yourself feel better when you do not feel well. They are simple, safe, and free. Uh, so the wellness toolbox, um, this is uh, going into, well, I'll go into the this part about section one. There are things that, that I, I need to do every day to stay well. And what those things are to me might be completely different than, than what they are for you. They're very personal. Uh, but just to give you an example, for me, uh, one of the things that, that I really have to do every day to stay well is uh, prayer and meditation. Um, just, just having that quiet time in the morning uh, before the, the busyness of the day to get quiet and uh, talk with my higher power and hopefully listen for some guidance. Um, so those, those are the things that I need to do every day to stay well. Um, you know, the basic ones, you know, eat well, uh, drink water, things like that that I, that I take for granted. Uh, but then there are some other things that, uh, that I might choose to do that maybe they don't have to be done every day, 
but I can, I can choose to do them and they help me with my, my mental wellness. Um, examples of those might be, we have three dogs. Um, our dogs love to be walked. And if I could, I would walk our dogs every day, but there are some days that, um, that I just don't have time to do it. But I know that when I take the time to walk my dogs, first of all, it's, uh, it's enjoyable for me to see them enjoying the walk, but it's also good for me. So walking my dogs is important. Um, the other is exercise. I have a stationary bike, probably should do it every day, but the reality is I'm not gonna do it every day. But it's, it's something there that when I do it, if it's two, three, five times a week, I always feel better um, after I use the exercise bike. Um, the, the section two that I'm going to talk about here, uh, stressors and triggers. So I've come to understand stressors as being those things outside of my environment that, uh, that can cause problems for me. Um, and an example for me would be conflict. Um, I grew up in a home where there was a lot of conflict, a lot of yelling, uh, some abuse. And so when I am in a situation where I'm seeing conflict happen, people yelling, to, yelling at each other, uh, two people getting in a fist fight, whatever it might be, that causes me a lot of stress. Um, so I recognize that today as one of my stressors. Um, and then triggers are those things that, uh, they're similar to stressors, but they're more internal than ex external. So, for instance, a trigger for me is um, I have, I'm prone to sometimes obsessive thinking, meaning that I'll latch on to something, um, something that, that, well, and a lot of times it might be something external, but the, but the thoughts from, come from internally. I start worrying about things that are beyond my control, um, and then that just tends to snowball, and pretty soon I'm worried about just everything. And so those triggers, I mean, I need to, the best thing I can do is recognize that a lot of times those thoughts are not based in reality. Um, and just to be able to stop sometimes and examine those and realize just because, you know, feelings are not facts. What's going on in between my ears is not always factual. And so it's, it's helpful for me to do that. Um, and then putting an action plan together around, around your stressors. Um, is, is helpful too, because sometimes just getting things down on paper, I know for me, and this is why I also like to journal, uh, getting things down on paper is, is really helpful for me. There's something that happens, the action of putting uh, pen to paper that it sort of internalizes and seems to go up my arm and into my head. It's really important for me to write those things down. Um, early, talk about early warning signs. Um, these are, these are uh, clear signals that, that, that things aren't going well and that you may be getting to the point where you need to ask for help. Um, early warning sign for me might be I really start isolating from the people, isolating from the people around me that I love and that love me. Uh, my wife, uh, my son, I'll just, I'll just shut down and stop talking. And when I stop talking, um, that's, that's an indication to me that, that there is a problem. Um, the other one is uh, just kind of uh, losing desire for doing the kind of things that I normally like to do. I really enjoy art um, and I enjoy reading and writing and when I just stop doing those things and I'm just kind of sitting around the house not doing anything, sometimes not wanting to get out of bed, pulling the covers over my head, those are pretty clear signals to me. And again, these, these, uh, these signs are personal. They're, they might be different from me than they are from you. So it's, that's, that's what's helpful about this, this RAP curriculum is we get to spend real quality time uh, stopping and looking at these things for us personally. Um, and then section four, when things are breaking down. These are the kind of things that happen that uh, it's important for us to be in touch with because they're, they're, clear, they're clear signals that we need help. We, we're no longer able to um, manage our own affairs. Um, and again, this can be uh, personal for, uh, for anybody. It can be um, just not ever leaving the house. It can be, you know, you stop bathing. Um, 
using drugs and alcohol, uh, just stopping, not no longer taking uh, responsibility for your own actions. And so this is where the crisis plan comes into play. If we can take the time to actually sit down and write out uh, a document or several pages, however you want to do it, that really is, um, I guess, kind of an outline for those people in our lives who we trust, who we, the people that we trust to make decisions for us. It might be a, it might be a spouse, or it might not be a spouse. It might purposely not be a spouse. It's somebody in your life that you trust that when you get to the point of I can no longer make decisions on my own, you're allowing that person to make decisions for you. Uh, the kind of things that, that can go into that are, for instance, you may have, um, if you require hospitalization, you might have hospitals that you want to go to and you might have hospitals that you don't want to go to. You might have uh, people that, other people in your life that you want to be made aware of your situation. You may have people in your life you don't, you don't want them to know what's, what's going on. Um, what medications to take. You know, once, once you go into a hospital, you're really, um, you're turning things over to sometimes a group of people who don't know you. Maybe they want the best for you, but they don't know you. And uh, you may have medications that you don't want to take, things that you don't want to do. So having this document written out um, is, is a really important tool to have as well. Um, Supporters, uh, well, we talked about this already a little bit. Those, those people that you count on as supporters. <laughs> I heard one, one person say that one of her supporters was actually her veterinarian. It's a woman who's maybe not a friend of hers, not somebody that she has a, you know, a, a normal everyday relationship with, but it's somebody that she trusts to make decisions for her. Um, we talked a, a little bit, again, and, th and this is about self-advocacy. This is about being able to tell clinicians and other folks which medications you're open to taking, which you're not, what kind of treatments, you know, uh, that, that you're open to and what kind, what kind you're not, what treatment facilities you want to go to and which ones you don't want to go to. Um, and then another part of the, of the plan is in a, inactivating it. When you get to that point where you feel that you can start making decisions on your own again, you can make that conscious decision and tell that supporter or those supporters in your, in your life that you no longer need them to make decisions for you. you you're back on your feet and you can start making your own decisions. Um, and then a post-crisis plan. Uh, so this is sort of, I guess, sort of an outline or steps that you can take once you're feeling well, um, setting out a a timetable for for how and when you want to take back responsibilities. Another example that I heard from a, a person is um, she talked about her mail. She had had a, I guess, a fairly prolonged hospitalization experience, and when she got back and she was she would, you know had worked on her, uh, you know, getting her responsibility back and so forth. She got back to her apartment and she had basically a giant cardboard box full of mail. Uh, bills, you know, just stuff that hadn't been looked at while she was in the hospital. Well, that was overwhelming for her, just the idea of having to go through that mail. Um, it was just too much for her. So she was able to have, ask for her supporters to help her with that. So now we're going to move into recovery topics. We doing okay on time? Because that went out. Yes. Okay. Go ahead and, okay. and just cover that okay. last bit and we'll roll. Wrap it up. Okay. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. <laughs> Wrap it up. Uh, recovery topics. Um, these are, uh, well, a really important part of that. So I'll take them one at a time. One at a time. Self-esteem. You know, one of the things that we talk about in RAP is uh, holding other people in unconditional high regard. Well, one of the ways that we can do that is by first starting with ourselves. We have to hold ourselves in high regard before we can. Uh, really hold other people in high regard. And for me, a big part of that for me was um, my mental health challenges for a long time, I blamed myself as if, as if it was some kind of character disorder. Um, and so just recognizing that it, you know, it's an illness and it doesn't speak to my value or my worth as a person. 
uh, changing negative thoughts to positive ones. For me personally, I can't stop a negative thought. But what I can do is I can change it to a positive thought. Uh, peer support. Um, having that network of people around you that have common experience, one of the things I love about the clubhouse is I'm surrounded every day by 40 or 50 people that all have mental health challenges and I can connect with that. Um, work and career, for me that's you know keeping work and career in the pro uh, proper perspective. Uh, trauma recovery, um, you know, just, just you know, how do we recover from those traumatic uh, experiences in our lives? Recovery is possible, but it takes a lot of work. Um, suicide prevention, obviously a, a big one. We went, you know, I would want to know, um, it's been many years since I've had suicidal thoughts, but I would want to know, I would, I, would sure, I would sure hope that I would be able to reach out for help if I got to that place. Um, some additional issues, uh, that can be important around re recovery are our living space. You know, when we when we come home, do we have a clean, well managed space that we can live in? Do we have food in our refrigerator and so forth? What kind of lifestyle are we living? Are we living a healthy lifestyle? Are we taking care of ourselves? Are we exercising? Are we eating right? And are we staying motivated? You know, it's hard sometimes dealing with a mental mental health challenge to stay motivated, and sometimes we just gotta. We just gotta fake it until we make it, and just and just work on doing the next right thing. Again, knowing that no matter how bad things might be, this too shall pass. So that's just a, a really brief overview of what RAP is, and um, I'm glad we got to have this time today. And uh, thank you for being here. <laughs>